Thanks again, Mona, for that missions update. So good to, you know, keep our eyes looking out at the world. Keep our eyes looking out toward, you know, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And there's just something about, as a church, which is just keeping our heart and our focus outward and seeing those, those people that need to be reached. So praise God. Well, this morning we're going to go ahead and we are going to actually be... Um, continuing a part two of what we started last week. We had a message called Destination Jesus. Okay, and we kind of looked at the Apostle Paul's heart. You can see there at the at verse 10, it says, Paul is saying, and you got to remember Paul, this is at the end of his life. This is just a couple of years before he's about to be martyred. He says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. The Amplified says, for my determined purpose is that I may know him that I may have progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. So here Paul, who's walked with the Lord Jesus Christ, been caught up to the third heaven, seen amazing things that aren't even lawful to be spoken down on earth, comes back and just walks out this life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of his life, his hunger, his desire is to know Jesus more and more. In fact, we see later on where he says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God that's in Christ Jesus. The apostle Paul just had a heart fixation on Jesus and knowing Jesus and following after the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that is your heart, when that is your goal, when your finish line is Jesus, you know, I said last week, if that's your heart, you will accidentally get free from a lot of things you've been trying to get free from your whole life as you're going after Jesus. Because we make those things our goal, our finish lines. And the problem is we finish our race early with stuff overcoming things, overcoming a fear, maybe overcoming an addiction. But when you begin to really live for Jesus, we find out it's not just about that stuff. We said that it's about, as far as living for Jesus, it's, um, I'm sorry, I think I might be losing my deal. Am I doing that or did you do that? I did that? Okay. All right. So we're talking about destination Jesus. And we said it's destination Jesus. It's about Jesus. We said destination Jesus, not people. When your heart, you got Paul's heart that's going after Jesus that I might know him. Paul loved people. Paul ministered to myriads of people, but he wasn't centered up on any one person. His center was Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself was very clear when he said, um, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the supreme command. Loving God with all of our heart. And that's the command that doesn't change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That still stays the supreme command. The covenants have changed. The promises have changed. The way that we're made right before God has changed the blood of Jesus Christ. But that heart cry of loving God with all your heart, that has not changed from the old covenant to the new covenant. We have that one here. And you see Paul is, has that in his heart. It's what, it's what brings him forward pulls him forward, which is what moves him on. And here Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, by comparison, you must hate everyone else, father, mother, wife, children. So he was, Jesus was saying, man, you've just got to, you got to keep me first. Otherwise, you can't, can't be my disciple. I can only disciple you as far as you'll let me. As soon as you center up on people or a relationship, and that takes supreme authority over my lordship, there's only so much I can do. You got to center up on Jesus. My trust in my heart is not in people. My trust is in Jesus. I trust people. I trust Jesus with people, but my trust is Jesus. I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, and I love my neighbor as myself. I love people. That's the second commandment, but my, my heart is Jesus. I worship Jesus. I don't worship people. My heart, I love people, but I worship Jesus. There's a difference in my heart there. And you can see that. My destination is Jesus. Like Paul, he had a heart for Jesus, that, that even when people did him wrong, he still loved him, forgave him, but that's why he could. He could move on because his heart was Jesus in the first place. And so we see destination Jesus. Jesus said that's got to be first and foremost. The second thing we talked about was destination Jesus, not places, okay? And uh, we, we look at verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand 
of the throne of God. Um, the Passion Translation says, we look away from the natural realm, we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and leads us forward into faith's perfection. Um, the Apostle Paul said, I pray with great faith. He who began, the good, who began this glorious work will, fa- will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he said that, yeah, Jesus is the author of our faith. He's the finisher of our faith. What am I doing? I'm, ge- I'm overcoming the world by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testament. I'm overcoming stuff, but I'm looking unto Jesus. My eyes are on him. He is my finish line. He is my destiny. He is where I'm heading to. And like I said before, even in my life where I try to make the object of my faith freedom from this thing or freedom from that thing, and it's like, if I could just get free from that, oh, I'd do great things for God. And that's really my focus. But when my focus is Jesus Christ, man, I'm going to pass through that place, but I'm not going to stop at that place. I'm going through. I'm going through to Jesus he is my reason. He is my victory. It's not just about getting free from that fear or from that weight. I'm getting free from that so because I got a race I'm running. I got things he wants me to do. I'm getting lightened so my heart and my mind is focused on what he's called me to do. Jesus is my focus, not the places along the way. I thank God for the place. Like I said last week, if you're kind of driving along the highway and you got a place there and you've been trying to get free from that and your focus is on Jesus and now you're driving past it and your heart and mind is your emotions are healed and things are going on. I said, I might we might honk on the way through. We're celebrating. Great. I'm not bound by that fear. I'm not bound by that addiction, but that was never my finish line in the first place. Jesus, Jesus. And when your heart like Paul was fixed on Jesus, then you get traction. You begin to go somewhere. You know, that's, that's the thing that really causes things to happen and things to change in your life. Um, kind of likened it last week too, to like that, the, the June bug on its back. You know, it's moving, the legs are all going, but it's just stuck there. It's just frozen there. And that's the way I'm praying, I'm going to church, I'm doing all my stuff. But when Jesus is your focus, then your motive for wanting to get free changes. Your motive for loving people is different. You're doing it because you love him. So last week we're talking about destination Jesus, what it's not. This week we're going to talk about destination Jesus, what it is, okay, in terms of Jesus. So as we're looking at destination Jesus, destination Jesus, your Lord. This is a powerful, freeing truth that when you get a revelation of Jesus as your Lord, it will simplify your Christian walk in a lot of ways. Because Lord is something that happened when we got born again, when we got saved, when we, got, when we called upon his name. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, supreme authority, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Openly declaring your faith that Jesus Christ came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross, and through his shed blood, I'm forgiven of all my sins, and God raised him from the dead. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a gospel. It is good news. It's truth, but it's powerful to save a soul. It's not a fable or a fairy tale. Those words I just said, when a human heart believes them, it causes them to go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. When you yield yourself to that message, you're yielding yourself to Jesus as Lord. Yeah, you get born again, but something else happens. You get a Lord. You get somebody who loves you enough to die for you who wants to be actively involved in your life and help you navigate this planet of (laughs) flesh world and the devil that we live in to help you navigate it as a good shepherd, to help you navigate it and, and come out successful and blessed and protected and strengthened. So we see that he is Lord. So I'm saying, destination Jesus, Lord. Now, one of the best things that has helped me in understanding lordship and Jesus as my Lord is his relationship with the Father. And what we see about Jesus' life when he came, he modeled what we are to do with him as our Lord. He did it with the Heavenly Father. Philippians 2, 5 through 9 says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Attitude. Though he was God, he didn't think think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position as a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, the Father, and died a criminal's death on a cross. 
Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. Look at that verse 5. Jesus demonstrated something that we're supposed to, he had an attitude that we're supposed to emulate. We're supposed to be just like him. And Jesus, when he was on his earthly ministry, we think of the amazing teachings, we think of the miracles, we think of all the great things that he did. But something that we've got to realize in the broader context of what Jesus did was this. And this is what Jesus said of himself. He said, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. I, and I know his commands lead to eternal life, so I say whatever the Father tells me to say. Do we love our Lord Jesus' teachings? Yeah, he was saying what the Father said. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. So we see something about Jesus, and this is so important to understand as it relates to the Lordship of Jesus in your life. When you look at Jesus, you need to see something broader. You need to see his walk with the Father. Because everything he ever did came out of that. He just had this relationship with the Father. You think there were times where he would go, and the Bible says he'd heal the multitude. He'd heal them all. He'd go to Bethesda once, and he just healed one guy. You know, he would do different things. One time he'd rub mud on a man's eyes to make him see. He would do things in different ways, and you knew one thing about whatever he was going to do next. He was doing what he saw. He would say what he heard. What did he have? He had, although he was God, he had an attitude. He had a humble attitude. I'm going to be led of the Father. The Father, the Father, the Father. So much so that before he went to the cross, Philip said, oh, Jesus, show us the Father. Show us the Father. It's like, he's the one pulling your strings. And Jesus would say, yes, you're right. And he says, How, haven't you seen me? Have I been so long with you, Philip, and still you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I'm saying what I hear him say, and I'm doing what I see him do. Yet he did it as a man, humbled as our example. And the Bible says about him when he did that, therefore God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. He was not about his reputation in this slice of time. He knew the father was going to do something for him on the back end that would be far greater than he could ever do for himself here. He had an attitude I'm going to do, Father, whatever you want me to do. I'm going to be obedient to what you want me to do. The sufferings of this present time aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us, in us, and conferred upon us. Okay, that's back-end stuff. Verse 9 is back-end stuff that Jesus experienced later. But in the meantime, he walked with his heavenly Father being Lord of his life, Lord of what he said, and Lord of what he did. And that's a powerful thing because then when we kind of move it in, we begin to see Jesus kind of changes the paradigm. Just before he's about to go to the cross, he says something. Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority. Hmm. Sounds like Jesus with the father, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Wow. Wow. So the Holy Spirit, even when you're getting things from the Spirit of God, is communicating from Jesus to you the same way Jesus communicated from the Father to us. What did Jesus model for us? He modeled lordship. He modeled a person who is submitted, who submitted. Even when you think of the people that Jesus loved and ministered to, when he would pray to the Father, he'd say, Lord, I, I, I've kept all these that you gave me. All that you gave me, Lord, I have kept them for you. They're yours. You know, Jesus even didn't have a sense of possession or ownership on the people he loved, but he did what he knew because the Father told him to minister to. And as you're going through, you know, God's going to begin to show you things by the Spirit of God. Verse 14, this is Romans 8, 14, says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Philippians 2, 13, For God is working in you, giving you a desire and power to do what pleases him. So what are we seeing here? Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could hear from the Lord. We could hear from our Lord Jesus what to say, what to do. We have an attitude, we have an attitude of humility that, wow, in the same way Jesus was, was led by the Father and everything he did, I am led by the Holy Spirit in what I do. 
the scope of my ministry, what I do, the scope of your life, the people you touch, the people you reach. They're going to come through what God has prepared and ordained you. Ephesians 2.10 puts it this way. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Now, a lot of times we'll say, God has a great plan for your life. Amen, he does. You can see it right there in Ephesians 2.10. God had a, the father had a great plan for the son's life. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but to bring salvation to the whole world. It's an amazing plan. But in the same way, Jesus walked out that plan in obedience to the Father. We've got a great plan, but we're walking it out in obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ of the Holy Spirit. All right? Why is this important? When you see Jesus, you don't see Jesus all upset. You don't see Jesus trying to, you know... Um, dot I's and cross T's in a way that he's nervous and trying to get through a to-do list or anything. He's just listening to the Father. He's just waiting on the Father. Just cool. Why? Because, yeah, does he know that he, the Father has plans? Yeah, he knows it. Does he know Scripture had to be fulfilled? Yeah, but he's going to say what he hears the Father say. He's going to do what he sees the Father do. It is an ultimate way you are listening. You're, you live in an attitude of listening on the inside. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit so we can be listening on the inside. I love that time, you know, we, we've got the, the story where you got the woman caught in the act of adultery, and they're rattling Jesus. What do we do, Jesus? Are we going to stone her, or do we not stone her? Do we stone her, or do we not stone her? And we see Jesus, he's just like drawing in the sand, and they're getting more anxious. Do we stone her, or do we not stone her? Come on, Jesus, tell us, what do we do? He's just cool as a cucumber, and you know one thing about whatever he's about to say next. He's going to say whatever he hears, he hears the Father say. And then when he gets it, he says it. He who among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Ah, I love that. When you wait for what God tells you to do, there will be an anointing on it. It'll be graced. You might have to wait. People might be a little nervous. You know, I think of King Saul. Samuel, I think, told him, Saul, wait for me. Wait for me till I get there. He got impatient. The people got impatient. And so he just did something spiritual and did a sacrifice. How can you argue with making a sacrifice? He said, no, wait, wait. The Holy Spirit is in you to lead and guide you into all truth. And sometimes, you know, as you're praying, as you're asking, God's going to give you the direction. He'll give you the witness. Now let me give you a quick little, a little, um, some guidelines. This isn't a message on how to be led by the Spirit. This is really destination Jesus, his Lordship realizing it. But when he speaks to you, when this begins to happen, this action of the Holy Spirit beginning to show you things to come and um, uh, you know, leading and guiding you into all truth and working in you to will and to do, what, that happens, it, what happens is there will be a repetition. In other words, you're thinking that, man, you, you're, you're having a thought and think, maybe that's God, maybe that's not God. But those God thoughts just seem to keep coming back over and over and over again. I, I liken it to the, um, if you ever, if you, you're in my generation, you ever watched Sesame Street back in the 70s, they would have that little thing where the day was brought to you by a number. And they'd have this little segment where they would go, one, two, three, four, 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 let's sing a song about four. And you know, you're, you're hoping it's gonna be your age, you know, because they'd kind of do it right around there. And, and you're, you'd look at that and be four ducks, four chickens, four, everything was four. And when you're listening and the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you into all truth, it's kind of like that. He'll give you a witness and all of a sudden you're seeing it and you're hearing it and all of a sudden you're seeing it everywhere. Today has been brought to you by, you know, the Holy Spirit, yeah. It's great the way the Holy Spirit, he's sweet and kind and gentle, but it's repetition. When he is leading you and guiding you, it's like, oh, I thought I got away from that. No, nope, I guess I'm not away from that. Okay, Lord, is there something there? Better to, I'm about to do this. I'm about to step out, Lord. There's a repetition, but there's also a peace. The scripture says in Colossians, let the peace of God rule in your heart. It's kind of like the old hot, cold game trying to find a hidden, we do with our kids, Easter basket. You know, if you're getting close, you're hot. If you're wa walking away, you're cold. And as you begin to walk through, it's not an emotional thing, like, oh, I feel good, I feel bad. There's just peace. There's just peace. 
Yeah, I could take the next step. I could take the next step. Or if I'm going towards something and I feel no desire. See, that's what verse 13 is. God's working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. He's working in you to will and to do. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And he, as your Lord, as your Lord, you acknowledge that. That's not a little thing. He's the Lord of my life. He gave me the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. I esteem that and I listen to that and I'm following that peace. And so there is a witness of just that, that repetition, praise God, and then there's a peace, and then there's usually a revelation to it too, a spirit of wisdom and revelation. In other words, it's not just to do that, but the Lord will show you sometimes how that connects and how it's part of a bigger picture. When we uh, you know, and went to a, um, a church, we were kind of in transition there too, and I'm saying, Lord, I've got like four different options that I could do. And the thing that the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, spoke to me, he said, yeah, I know, Ed, you, you got these four options, and I had my, my pros and cons for each of them. Nothing wrong with writing out options and advantages, disadvantages, um, and just to understand what you're dealing with. But when the Lord spoke to me, as I was kind of looking out, out at my options, kind of this inflection point, you know, I could go back to Bible school, get more education, I could start a new church, I could help my pastor start his church, um, you know, and, or just stay where I was. And the Lord just very clearly by the Spirit said, Ed, of those things, what keeps coming back to you the most? What keeps coming back to you the most? And it was, well, it was helping my pastor start his church, you know, and had my pros and cons. The cons was about an hour, hour and a half away, drive with four little kids. And so I was thinking, you know, that would be a con, that drive every Sunday in the car. But then the pros, as far as it's going to help you, it's going to give you a chance to get grounded, it's going to give you a chance to what it, experience what it's like to start a church. And you got people who love you, who believe in you. All of a sudden, when the, the thing that keeps coming back to you the most, you look at it, take a harder look at it. And there's going to be pros and cons to it, but I'll tell you what, when that's the will of God, those pros will jump out at you. And it's like, praise God, that's is the leading of the Lord. And the cons, whatever they might be, you'll have grace for whatever those cons are. But the anointing and the leading of the Holy Spirit, he's there to lead and guide you into all truth. That's a big part of destination Jesus. Lord, you are my Lord. I am, he's not my workmanship. I am his workmanship. I'm discovering what he's called me to do. I have that listening on the inside that when I get to the end of my life, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. Like Jesus, he lived as a servant. He lived obedient to the Father. And, they, and then he was raised. He experienced a glory. He experienced a reward. We're storing up rewards in heaven. But understanding there's a lordship of Jesus, and that is a big part of destination Jesus is his lordship. The other one is destination Jesus, your savior. Okay? This is... Um, I think this is such a big part of, in terms of understanding destination, that we've got to realize, and I think we lose sight of, and I, I kind of put these two together, Lord and Savior, because as we're, as we're letting him be the Lord of our life, and we're making decisions in our life, different things like that, we got to realize that this is, a very, this is a very small part of our life. Jesus was only on this earth for 33 years. We're only on this earth for a few years. Whether it's a year or a hundred years, in the light of eternity, it's a few years. It's tiny. It's, it's a vapor of life, the scripture calls it. But we, we find out something about Jesus. Jesus was looking forward to something. And this is something when we, we're thinking destination Jesus, the apostle Paul, you'll see this come through his heart as he's talking about his love for the Lord. Je this is Jesus saying, John 14, do, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. This is something that Jesus wanted his followers to know, that, where he, that he is going to prepare a place for us, that our destination is heaven. We are going to be with him forever. That is something that I think can almost get cliche in our thinking, and we can lose sight of just how significant that is. I mean, this is all about that. The Apostle Paul said, man, if this isn't about heaven, then forget it. He put it this way. He said, if the only benefit to our hope in Christ is limited to this life on earth, we deserve to be pitied more than all others. If we're just here observing our Christian religion, we've all got a lot better things we could be doing with our time right now. This is not about observing a religion or a faith. 
This is about honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will have a new religion. No. He'll have eternal life. There is nothing that we can do, man, creating religious or establishments or buildings. It's all about one thing. We're here this morning. Why? God gave pastors, teachers for the edifying of the body of Christ to be built up, to do the work that he's called us to do, to fulfill those good works so that we can bring glory to God and be with him someday. That's what Paul said. Man, if our only hope in Christ is this earth, life on this earth, our religion, and to get popularity as a religion and da-da-da, that's nothing. It's vanity. Eternal life is real. Heaven is real. Heaven in your eyes. And this is what you see, the Apostle Paul. Now think about this. This is the same book that he declared that I might know him, all right? What does he say? We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Praise God. He is going to, and this is the Apostle Paul, he's thinking, we are citizens of heaven. He's looking there, eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. We are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior, Jesus' Savior. And I've been challenged by this. Ed, are you eagerly waiting for him to return as your Savior? One of the reasons Jesus could go through the junk is because there was a joy that was set before him. And one of the reasons I kind of feel sorry for myself in my junk is I lose sight of the joy that is set before me. Destination Jesus. I'm going to be with him forever and ever and ever in heaven. I'm going to let my mind go there. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to set my mind and think, wow, Jesus, it's going to be amazing. It is going to be amazing to see Jesus face to face. Can you imagine seeing Jesus face to face? Having that, this is a, um, this was a little uh, poem that you, a lot of you guys have probably seen this, but, um, and I didn't put it up on the slide, but it's, it's the little picture of the guy kind of giving Jesus a hug. It says, when I come home to heaven, how joyful it will be. For on that day at last, my risen Lord, I'll see no greater happiness than to see him face to face, to see the love in his eyes and to feel his warm embrace. Then why should earthly cares weigh down upon me so there'll be a distant memory when home at last I go? We're given this hope now. You understand? The Apostle Paul, he said in Corinthians, he says, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is real, then we'll know fully as we're fully known. The part that we know is this. We know we're going to be with him forever in heaven. We know that we're going to see him on that day. We know we're going to see him face to face. It's going to be an amazing thing. I'm going to love that embrace of Jesus. Eternity in heaven. Not only that, but we'll all enjoy hanging out with maybe our bi favorite Bible characters, you know, asking them some questions about what it was like and different things like that. But you know one of the coolest things is going to be? After I see Jesus and give him the hug and my loved ones that are there right now and, and Bible characters is going to be seeing you guys. Because we're going to have a look when we look at each other in heaven that'll be unique. That'll be part of the body of Christ and the work that he called us to do. And when we've been there 10,000 years and we still cross glances, we're going to be going, yeah, yep, that's pretty amazing to be a part of that together, part of the body of Christ together. I mean, that's going to be an amazing thing. This is real. We did a, um, uh, for the men's retreat, we, we went through the Lord of the Rings trilogy and kind of did that spiritual plane across that. And, you know, you get to the end and they go back to this glorious, beautiful green shire and you get the, you know, Frodo and Sam and... Pippin and Mary, just all kind of there in that final scene. They're just kind of doing a little toast. And they don't even say anything. They're just words can't even do it. They just look at each other. They just came through saving the whole area, you know, you know from destruction. And I'll tell you what, there's going to be a special look that we have that's unique from even the great Bible characters of our, that we're going to appreciate and, and that. But there's a unique because we're working. We're doing the things of God together. We're serving him as our Lord. We're following those inner witnesses together and he's connected us together in this body. We got that to look forward to. And the Bible says, look forward to it. It's okay. Let your mind go there. Let your heart be comforted by that. Paul says he's going to take these weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power 
with which he will bring everything under his control. We've seen him use that power to split the sea in half. We see him use that power to raise Jesus from the dead. And there's coming a day when he says he's going to use that power to change your mortal body into a glorified body. He's going to take that, whether it's, whether it's alive or whether it's in the grave. This is kind of a more of a detailed version of what he just got done saying there. He, he's writing to the Thessalonians. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. You just can't get any more authoritative than that. The word declaring this is the word of the Lord. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who've died will rise from their graves. So think about this. He's the, the believers, to be absent with, from the body is to be present with the Lord. They're already in heaven. He's going to take them in their new creation, human spirits from heaven with him. They're going to come and they're going to go and they are going to have a resurrected body a little bit before we do. All right? And they, they will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds. We're going to experience that change. To meet the Lord in the air, then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. That's a great ending to this story. That's an epic ending. You know, there's a glorious unfolding. You know, we're not at the end of the story right now. We're still in the middle of the major plot unfolding, you know, that the scripture prophesied would happen. But the scripture does tell us how this thing's going to end. This thing's going to end with me and you having glorified bodies present with the Lord forever and ever and ever. And it's just hard to wrap our mind around what that fully is and fully means. We just know it's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. It's going to be familiar. I mean, the things that we've already experienced in God, it's just going to be amped up. It's not going to be amazing, but it's going to be familiar. It's going to be, wow, this is right. This is the same one I've been perceiving, the same one who's been Lord of my life, the witnesses that I've been perceiving and, perceiving and being obedient to his lordship throughout my life and been saying yes and learning how to walk with him. Now I'm going to see him face to face, the one I've been perceiving, the one who's been giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to see him face to face, and he's going to change me. And my body's going to be fashioned like unto his glorious body, Paul says in um, verse 21. Be bodies like his own. So it's going to be an amazing thing. This is our eternity. This is where we're heading. So we're talking about destination Jesus. Keep in mind, keep in your heart, your destination is Jesus. The apostle Paul said, man, that I might know him. My heart cry is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I've just really sensed in my spirit lately too, it really does come down to that. Whenever it feels like things are complicated, there has been kind of a popular phrase in recent years, what would Jesus do? Kind of put a twist on that. What would somebody who's loving the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength do? Bring it back to the first commandment. Bring it back to loving Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. That's a powerful thing. It's different. It's different than just, I mean, I read the word and I can say even where forgiveness, you know, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. But emotionally, you don't feel that when your mind and your things is just like, like I said a few weeks before, it's like a snow globe. Your emotions are like all those little flakes going around. And you feel, you feel flaky. You feel not connected and stable, you know? And right in the middle of that flakiness, you're just walking by faith and there's just nothing in you that just wants to do that or do that. But when you begin to say, what, what, what kind of help settles the snow for me? is when I kind of go back and say, okay, Lord, uh, I know I'm feeling, thinking, confusion, every evil work, different things like that. Lord, what, what? Because this all, ultimately it comes down to this. 
It's about what you've done for me. You loved me. You gave yourself for me. That doesn't change. No matter what people do to me, say to me, doesn't change what you did for me 2,000 years ago. That's a fixed point. And the commandment, the greatest one, is to just love you. Lord, I don't really feel like loving that person, but out of my love for you and respect for your word, I'm going to obey you, sir, and love you and obey you and forgive, even as you have forgiven me. I've done that before. And the Lord brought to me an account. If you ever read that little book of Philemon, the book of Philemon is an amazing little book. It's tiny. You could read it in a couple minutes, but it's powerful. It's a story of a runaway slave. And the apostle Paul happens to get him saved in jail. I don't know if they were in the jail together or what it is. But Paul also knows the slave owner of the guy who he ran away from. His name's Onesimus. And Paul is going, oh, you ran away from Onesimus. Okay, I know him. He's a believer. And so he writes Philemon. I, I'm, um, Philemon is, I'm, I got that, got that backwards. Philemon is the, is the owner, like the, the owner of this slave. Onesimus is the runaway slave. But Paul, Paul gets Onesimus saved. And so he writes this book back to Philemon. And it says, hey, Philemon got good news. Your slave, you know, the guy that ran away from you? Now Philemon would have probably legal right to, to have him killed if he wanted to is, is his owner. Paul says, I got great news for you, Philemon. I'm sending an Onesimus back to you, but now I'm sending him back to you, not as a slave, but as a brother. Oh, and if he's done anything wrong, you can put that on my account. You know, and, uh, and of course, Paul was instrumental in, in Philemon's life too. And I've, I've had the Lord show me that where I'm, I'm kind of in that place. I'm snow globing, but God is saying, you know, and I know what Ephesians 2, 4.32 says, be kind, tender, hard, and forgiven. And when I'm going there and I'm saying, okay, Lord, out of respect, he said, Ed, and then when you do that sometimes, this is just what happened to me. And, you know, all of a sudden you begin, he just said that word to me. He said, Ed, it's okay. Put it on my account. If they've done anything wrong to you, put that on my account. Because it really was on his account because he died for that too, you know. And uh, when I see that, oh, yeah, right. And then pretty soon I saw another picture. I wasn't expecting to see this. You know, the scripture says, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, he'll stand or fall, and he will stand, for he is able to make him stand. And how many times I've been upheld by that scripture, and God has made me stand. And all of a sudden, in we, just the lordship of Jesus, okay, Lord. And the Lord showed me that picture of that person, and he showed me a picture of him holding that person up. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, he'll stand. And he will stand. I'll make him stand. All of a sudden, my heart broke. I began praying for that person. Not because I'm supposed to love the man who's praying for you. You get that perspective. That's true. It's you know, Matthew chapter 5. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. But I was seeing it from a different perspective now. I'm seeing my Lord holding that person up and going, wow, that's right. You're able to make them stand. And I want to cooperate with you, Lord. And I want to help them to stand too and pray. But what is that? That's, my, that's the lordship of Jesus. That's my, just, the only thing that kept me from doing that, again, while you're snow globing, is his lordship. But when, when that's good enough, he's my lord. No matter who's been done me wrong, no matter who, who, what I've done wrong, no matter how unfaithful I've been or how unfaithful people may have been to me, one thing's true. He's never been unfaithful to anyone or anything or anybody. And he deserves my loyalty as my lord. He's never done me wrong. He's always been living to make intercession for me, regardless of the circumstances. He's there. I believe that about him as my Lord. And I take him, and I believe that about him as my Lord. My destination is Jesus, his Lordship in my life. That's the safest place there is. You think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. What is that? That's the work of a Lord if you will let him be Lord. Your Lord is your good shepherd. You can trust him with the lordship of your life. Even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's feeling weird, destination Jesus. And that's the heart of Paul. He walked through that. Stonings, shipwrecks. You know, five times he received the 40 lashes save one or something like that. You know, and it wasn't like if the sixth time, then that's it. No, it didn't matter. He prayed, God, take it away. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm just going to keep going and going and going. Know that my Lord's grace is sufficient for me. He's there. He's got my back. Praise God. Destination Jesus. That's what made Paul tick. That's what made him keep going. 
That's why you couldn't shut him down. He'd say, persecutions and afflictions await me, but none of these things move me. He was moved by Jesus. He was moved by knowing him more. There's nothing that somebody can do to me that's going to cause me to not love God anymore and walk away. No way. People cannot control my love for Jesus, no matter what they do to me. Destination Jesus. One of the things the apostle Paul cried out, he said, I've been in danger of perils and toils, and he says, of false brethren. Paul had his heart broken from people too, but it was still Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. There was a certain guy named Demas that traveled with him. And you can see, if you look up, do a run a concordance on Demas, a faithful brother who was with him and supported him. In the last book, he makes reference of Demas. He says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Ah, oh. but it didn't chase Paul's heart. He wanted Jesus to love him. You don't want people to follow, but you realize that Jesus is my destination. He's my Lord. He's my center. There's no other person, father, mother, brother, sister, spouse, children, that can be my center. Jesus can only be my center. I've got to love him. And if you get that right, your heart will be in a place to be able to love other people. But we're talking, again, destination Jesus. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Lord of my life? It's not people. It's not a place I'm going to in terms of my own victory and overcoming. It's Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. He is the joy that is set before me. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning that you are our Lord. You are our Savior. Oh, Lord, help us to trust you as Lord, to see our whole life like the Apostle Paul, just to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. Lord, to make you our destiny, our heart cry, Father. You are perfect. You love us. Who else has the words of eternal life? Even if there's stuff we don't get, you are the one. You are the one we love. Go ahead and make this your declaration of faith if your heart can agree. Say, Lord Jesus, I call you Lord because you are my Lord. I love you more than any other person. You are my Lord. I love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. There is a sacred place in me that only you have. I worship you as God because you are God and you are worthy not only to open the scroll but to call the shots in my life I humble myself I'm going to change I'm going to let you change me from glory to glory as I behold you be Lord of my life. I need you, Jesus. You love me. You gave yourself for me. I give myself to you. I believe you died on that cross for everything I ever did wrong. I receive you into my heart as the Savior of my life. I will rise again whether alive or dead, it doesn't matter. We have the word of the Lord on this. I will live for you together. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your lordship. I let your voice through. Lead and guide me into all truth. My destination is you. When this spirit leaves this body, it's you face to face. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, let that kind of be a fresh reorientation. I'll tell you, I've shaken off a lot of self-pity complexes and different things like that when I just bring it back to Jesus. I don't center up on people's imperfections or what they said or what they did. I center up on, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You, you, when that's your starting point, you're all right. You got an anchor. You got a foundation. When anything else is your foundation, you got sink and sand. People can't be your foundation. Places can't be your foundation. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. 
We even told one church, man, you guys are great. You're powerful. You're testing false witnesses. I have this one thing against you. Return to your first love. Go back to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. When he put the spirit in our heart, it cried something. Abba, Father. That's the heart cry of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Abba, Father. Daddy, Daddy. That's his heart cry in you, through you, to him. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You're in his hand. No one can take you from his hand. See yourself there. There's something about when you know your heart's loyal to Jesus, ah, there's a boldness there. So let it go back to that. Jesus, Jesus. He is the destination. Amen. Praise God.